Mr. Speaker, I listened with incredulity as members of the opposition came one after the other over the past three days and made presentations riddled with inaccuracies and unsubstantiated claims. Mr. Speaker, we are here to debate the national budget. This is serious business. The electorate is tuned in and listening to everything that we are saying in this House. The least, the least we could do is be factual and credible in our presentations. Case on point, the honorable member who spoke just before me. The smallest child in this country, Mr. Speaker, knows that this PPPC government is the most consultative government they have ever had. The smallest child at home knows that. And he just accused the government of no consultation. He spoke about Linden as they love to speak about Linden and they love to express their love for Linden. All of the matters he raised just now are minor. We can easily fix them. The question is, why didn't they fix it when they were in office for five years? Mr. Speaker, this was yesterday. 2020 was a short time ago. It's not a long time ago we're talking about. These people were just in government. Bauxite, logging, all of these industries, they decimated. We had hundreds of workers from Russell that were sent home because their government antagonized the bauxite company. We had people in Linden. We had people in Linden who hung signs, loggers, hung signs around their necks. Do you remember that? Saying that they were hungry because they got no support from the APNU AFC government when they were in office. Mr. Speaker, credibility is extremely important. The APNU AFC are claiming to be champions of squatters, but never created a single new house lot in five years. The APNU AFC are calling for full-time jobs, but put thousands of people out of work. The APNU AFC are claiming the budget is for friends, families, and cronies, but it was the honorable member of all the Lawrence who said we can only give work to PNC people. The APNU AFC are asking for cash transfers, but took away $10,000 from our school children. The APNU AFC are calling for free university education, but raised tuition by 35%, and even taxed education. The APNU AFC are calling the government racist, but their leader is being accused of racism by members of his own party. The APNU AFC are calling for cheaper energy, but they impose a tax on electricity and bankrupt the national power company. The APNU AFC are calling for increased social welfare, but taxed water and took away the subsidy given to pensioners. Mr. Speaker, credibility is extremely important when you're going to come to this House and make claims. That is the legacy of the APNU and the AFC combined opposition. The opposition has no moral authority to speak of what they themselves failed to do. We have heard a lot of sloganeering and song bites but no sound political argument has been made against this budget up to now, and I don't expect any to be forthcoming from the opposition. Norton said that the PPP, he said in a, Honorable Member Norton in a press statement, said that the PPP has no national development plan. Mr. Speaker, again, the smallest child in this country can tell you about some of our programs and plans that we have had since 2020 when we issued our manifesto and have been making our plans and our programs available. We've been speaking about it publicly. We laid out our vision for five years in government. 
Mr. Speaker, there are 31 members of the AP and UAFC, and only 29% of their members served in senior positions when they were in office. 71% of them never hold any senior substantive position in government, including the leader of the opposition. Now imagine um, the majority of them have no experience to govern. They do not understand how government works. And these are the people that are advocating for a chance at government. Ima imagine uh, Jurita Fernandes, Honorable Member, shadowing the Honorable Senior Minister, Dr. Ashni Kumar Singh, a man who is a financial genius, an economic czar. And she comes here trying to sound profound after reading the series, Economics for Dummies. What is her qualification? What is her occupation? But they come here to analyze a budget they are incapable of understanding. Mr. Speaker, there is an evolving trend in the opposition to take credit for the oil and gas sector. Mr. Speaker, oil was found under our government. And I remember clearly, they even said it was an election gimmick. What they must be clear to take credit for is the bad deal that they signed with Exxon. That is what they have to take credit for, not for the investments that we are making now with the limited access to resources that we have. We have to prioritize. So that is not what they should take credit for, Mr. Speaker. They must take credit for the bad deal. Mr. Speaker, in the Global Witness Report signed away, we have to remind our people about what the APNU AFC did. The people of our country must be reminded that when the AP and UAFC were supposed to be guardians of all our oil resources, Trotman went to Texas and instead of negotiating the best deal for Guyana, the then minister spent his time, and I quote, touring Exxon's new glass and steel offices. And in his report said that the most impressive thing he saw was, I quote, the very strong smell of oil that filled the room. Mr. Speaker, they sold out this country. The report concluded that the government was not working in Guyana's best interests. This is the legacy of the APNU, AFC. And we must remember the torment of bad decisions and the visionless leadership when these people were in office. We must remember how the country was adrift. There was no direction. So they must not now come here and grandstand as though they are the beneficiaries of some divine wisdom of what is best for Guyana. Their track record tells a very different story. In their 33 years of government in this country, the APNU AFC has not had a single new idea. They have been reading the same book since the 1960s. There has been no evolution in that party. Mr. Speaker, in the past few budgets, you would recall that a common criticism used to be private sector budget. Every PPP C budget used to be a private sector budget. That was a common criticism. This year, they have gone back to a line that they used in 2015, and they are claiming corruption in government. The APNU AFC manifesto, and in 2015, they were so committed to this line. Honorable member, I really am trying to take the track of the substantive speaker and not interrupt. Um, remember when you're speaking about the members in this house, they are the honorable members. So if you're referring to them, it has to be the honorable member, not they are them, and so on and so forth. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so guided. Mr. Speaker, the most honorable members on the APNU AFC were so 
convinced that they were go going to take office in 2015 and prove to the country that our government was corrupt, that they dedicated an entire section in the 2015 manifesto called Reaping the Democratic Dividend. And they said that in the democratic dividend, they would be able to finance the new government because, you know, the PPP was so corrupt, they would be able um, to rein in all of this money through corruption, and they would be able to finance a part of their government. And they had a, a list of points. I'll only pick out three, uh, Mr. Speaker. Reducing capital flight. This is currently estimated at 200 million US dollars annually. We expect savings to be between 10 and 20% of this total. Number two, augmenting capital inflows. This is currently estimated at about 450 million US dollars annually as a result of our improved political environment. This augmentation is projected to be 15%. Reducing procurement fraud estimated by the, to be about 25 to 35 percent of total procurement spending of 140 billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, they were so concerned about corruption and adherence to the procurement laws, but once they took office, what did the APNU AFC do? Durban Park Project over a billion dollars, $600 million unaccounted for. Motion scales still to be delivered to public works ministries six years later. The contract said that 50% of the contract sum is supposed to be paid. Instead, the full contract sum was paid, no scales delivered. They talk about cronies, friends and cronies. Audit into motion scales fine supplier was APNU AFC associate, a crony, Mr. Speaker, a friend. And I'm going to lay all of these over for the record. Minister Hughes, Cathy Hughes, in clear breach of integrity act, giving her own company contracts from her own ministry. You have the $1.8 billion spent on a chemical called Sequest by the then uh, head of GWI, Van West Charles. $1.8 billion spent on a, on a chemical to treat water that is a temporary solution. Mr. Speaker, on average, it costs about $1.2 billion to build a permanent large treatment plant that can give treated water to thousands of people on a permanent basis that will last for decades. They spent $1.8 billion on a chemical, a temporary treatment through a corrupt transaction, which no receipts have been provided for, for this transaction. Honorable member, I think the, the guidance was provided earlier by the speaker and it will be repeated for honorable members i will take this opportunity to remind that we have standing orders that addresses when the speaker is speaking the issue of the words as was passed as was passed around by the speaker still stand and I would expect that every single member respects that list. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A highly irregular transaction for which there are no receipts for payments. And I must say that these were reports generated from the Auditor General. So that's what I'm quoting, uh, Mr. Speaker. You have sole sourcing scandal again that involved the Honorable Member Valda Lawrence who bypassed all of the procurement procedures and went directly uh, to source drugs to the tune of $1.5 billion. Tender process, billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. We have the tender process uh, that was canceled by the Honorable Member David Patterson in the infamous feasibility study where all of the procurement uh, laws were, were bypassed. So 
if we are going to speak about fraudulent transactions and we're going to accuse governments of misappropriating funds, we have to remember our own track record and they have to remember their track record when they were in office. And I want the people at home to know that they must not fall into this trap again because this was a mantra in 2015, Mr. Speaker, and we must not allow it to happen again. We have a member sitting right here in the National Assembly, the Honorable Ganesh Mai Paul, who was accused of misappropriating students' funds. But when he took the podium, accused me personally, and then tried to denigrate my character in this house. This, this is evidence, Mr. Speaker. He had none when he came to this house. Here, you know, I'm reading the article. This Starbrook News, April 26, 2013, UGSS president accused of misappropriating students' funds. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Ganesh Mai Paul. Go ahead. Thank Honourable. you, Mr. Speaker. Standing order 41 6. The Honorable Member is imputing, and I ask that she withdraw what she has just said because that is not true. There was an audit, sir. Sir, there was no, an audit. I have not given Honourable. permission, sir. Honourable. Sir, if I may. Mr. Speaker. Sir, if I may. Mr. Speaker, there was an I have not audit given that permission. was done by the University of Guyana. Honorable Member. Honorable Member. If you are standing on a point of clarification, no, not clarification. you have to ask the no, honourable member's permission sir, my to be able to clarify. Not honourable, sir, I'm not honourable minister, comrade speaker, comrade speaker, you, I'm not clarifying, sir, speaker. on a point of Ms. order. Speaker, I'm comrade speaker, I'm standing on forty-one. Honourable six. chief whip, thank you. Sir, I'm standing on forty-one Com six. Comrade speaker. The Honourable Member Ganesh Maipal is not standing on the standing order for clarification. He's not standing on clarification, sir, and he should be heard on what standing order he's standing on. Sir, I'm standing on 41.6. I'm standing on standing order 41.6, not 48, 41.6. Sir, I'm saying to you that an audit was carried out by the University of Guyana, and that Mr. matter was... In Sir, and that matter was investigated, and nowhere was it found that I misappropriated any sums of money. At no time was it found that I misappropriated any amount of money. And the audit was made public, sir. And my name was cleared. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we went through this before earlier. When I asked for the floor to clarify something, I was denied by the speaker. This is exactly I'm the same situation. The speaker has to be Mr. asked speaker, if she I'm agrees to give him time to explain. If he doesn't, Honorable that members. is too bad, Mr. Speaker. Forty one six, I'm standing on. Not clarification. The member is impeached. Mr. Speaker. Sir. Honorable. The honorable, honorable member admitted in the press that he had paid back because he borrowed sir, the money to buy a car. Sir, did not misappropriate. In order for there to be misappropriation, there has to be appropriation.
Honorable members, there is a reason why there is an honorable that prefaces every single member's name in this house. And as such, we must conduct ourselves in that order that is worthy to be displayed in a public manner as an example. I will not have this house descend into chaos in the absence of the substantive speaker. Honorable Minister, if you are reading from a report, I would expect that that report would be circulated through the house. Do continue. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a common theme Comrade Speaker. in their presence. Comrade Speaker, Mr. on a Speaker, point of order, please. Honorable Ganesh Michael. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Sir, I'm standing on 416, and I'm saying to you, sir, that there is a public audit that was done at the University of Guyana, of which my name was cleared. And the honorable member cannot be giving us half stories. There is also lay over that report, and it will show that my name was cleared. I am not saying that she cannot lay over what she I'm has there, but she's a newspaper me, report. Sir. The and member the only committed member. to taking that if she's the money. That Mr. half, there's another half. And she can lay over that audit report that cleared Mr. my Speaker, name. Thank you, when sir. When you borrow money without honorable, asking, there is one word minister. for it. Thank you. A common theme in their presentation. Mr. Speaker, can I ask that the member gets back her time due to the stoppages with the point of orders by Mr. Mai Paul? <clears throat> honorable Chief Whip. Thank you. That has. Mr. Mai Paul can bring his audit report if he so wishes. Honor Honorable member, your time will be given back for the interruptions. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A common theme in their presentations is high cost of living. And we have tackled this issue frontally and were proactive in implementing measures to ease the burden on our people. We distributed several cash grants. We removed VAT from water, electricity, and data. We kept shipping costs at pre-pandemic rates. We gave free fertilizers to farmers. We absorbed the increases in fuel and kept water and electricity tariffs stable with no increases. We absorb these burdens, Mr. Speaker, so that it will not be passed on to our people. They the APNU AFC members love to quote reports out of context. However, we did so much in measures to bring relief to our people, so much so that the IMF called on our government to reverse some of these measures, to reverse the tax subsidies aimed at easing the cost of living. So when they, the honorable members say that we have done nothing to ease cost of living in this country. We have the IMF report actually calling on our government to reverse some of the subsidies that we are giving because we have done so much already. And if there's more that we can do, we would certainly consider. Mr. Speaker, I shudder to think about where we would be in 2023 under the leadership of APNU AFC. Thankfully, Guyana now has a president and a government with vision, a clearly defined plan, and the experience to ensure prosperity comes to every home. Shifting my attention now to the budget itself, speaker after speaker has been calling for more money to be distributed to our people. But Mr. Speaker, our oil proceeds must be invested so that we can secure a brighter future for our people. Mr. Speaker, we could easily take the proceeds from oil and gas and distribute it. It would be a popular thing to do. It may even secure our next term in office. But Mr. Speaker, that would be irresponsible of us. And so we are investing in infrastructure aimed at improving lives, not infrastructure like Durban Park 
or arches which are totally useless and add no value to people's lives. People need to understand how the budget benefits them. I am fortunate, Mr. Speaker, to serve in a sector with achievements I do not need to boast about because the evidence of our achievements are available for all to see. Mr. Speaker, since we have taken office in 2020, we have embarked on an unprecedented housing program on a scale and magnitude never seen in this country before. Mr. Speaker, and no community, no community is left out of this development. Mr. Speaker, it was very unfortunate about what took place in Mocha. But I believe that many of, our, of my comrades on this side of the House has addressed that issue. And I believe that in the public sphere, that people understand what took place there. That 28 people who resided in Mocha were able to accept settlements and were able to relocate into areas where they were given certificates of title, compensation, and land for agriculture purposes. And so it was very unfortunate that we were not able to negotiate with all of those people, even though our offers are still on the table. Mr. Speaker, unlike the legacy of the APNU AFC for five years, where they did not create a single new house lots, we have ongoing at the moment infrastructure works in 54 new housing schemes. So all across this country, people will have access to housing. We are also ensuring that we increase our housing construction drive so that people can achieve home ownership even faster because we are making it more affordable. Our collaborations with the bank has been seeing lower interest rates for people to acquire cheaper mortgages and to be able to get people to transition faster into their own homes. We are going into communities, Mr. Speaker. We are working with everybody. No community is left out. And even though members of the opposition accused the Ministry of Housing of distributing titles in a certain area called Pigeon Island, which is a predominantly Indo-Guyanese community. They failed to recognize the work that we did in Beirut, which is a predominantly Afro-Guyanese community. So Mr. Speaker, when I went to Pigeon Island and distributed 44 titles, I went to Beirut and distributed 300 titles, Mr. Speaker, but they would never acknowledge that because it does not fit into their rhetoric. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that we have delivered in excess of 20,500 house lots. We have regularized 1,355 lots in regularized squatting areas. We have completed the Mocha to Diamond Interlink Road. We have completed the Mandela to Eccles four-lane highway and are in the process of extending that highway along with construction of the Schoonard Crane Highway in Region 3. We passed the Condominium Act and laid in this house the single window application bill for passage very soon. This is our record among many other achievements with a budgetary allocation of 54.5 billion dollars in housing and 17.7 billion for water we can continue the work we started in 2020 to pursue all of our targets and objectives in our carefully planned five-year program mr speaker from 2014 to now our budget has increased by over 1500 percent. The APNU AFC budget of 2016, 17, and 18 contain no subvention to the Ministry of Housing. So, Mr. Speaker, it is a natural consequence that if the central government does not make resources available for housing, that there will be no new housing schemes created under their government. Mr. Speaker, the housing program increases net worth. The actual 
the cost approximately to develop one house lot is $3 million for first phase development plus an additional $2 million for the final stage of development. Mr. Speaker, government subsidizes low-income housing by up to 90% in some cases. Let us examine this carefully, Mr. Speaker. Let's say, for example, on the higher side of the scale, a house lot in Region 4, let's say it costs $500,000. The approximate market value of that subsidized low-income lot after we have completed first phase infrastructure is $2,250,000, an appreciation, sir, of 450%. So, Mr. Speaker, before the beneficiary acquires a loan, before the beneficiary even purchases a load of sand, their net worth has already increased by 450% thanks to the subsidy that is provided by the government of Guyana. And this is what our housing program was designed to do when it was developed back in 1992 under Dr. Chetty Jagan. It was intended to subsidize low-income housing for people because this PPPC administration has always recognized the value that access to affordable housing adds to the development of our people. This is how we are empowering people and in transferring wealth by investing in infrastructure for our housing schemes. Not to be viewed through the lens of only building roads, but to be looked at holistically as building net worth and improving overall well-being of our people. Um, Mr. Speaker, the total number of new applications received for 2022 is 14,974. 21 to 39 year olds account for 10,763 of our total new applications, over 10,000. Mr. Speaker, this shows tremendous confidence in our housing program. Our young people are saying to us, we believe that the government has a good plan. We have seen evidence of the government delivering on this plan, and we are submitting our applications in the full confidence of knowing that we will receive our house lot. Mr. Speaker, when you look at women from 2020 to 2022. Honorable member, in order to conclude your presentation, you'll need a five minute extension, and that is including the time that was given back for your time allotted. Ms. Sorry, the honorable member started at 526. She speaks for 35 minutes. 30 plus 5, with an, as you said, with the extension of 5. And she was also interrupted for over 7 minutes at least by Mr. Ganesh Maipal. So at this point, she has not concluded her half an hour. And therefore, uh, we need to let her finish her half an hour before we go to the extension of 5 minutes. Honor Honorable member, in order to conclude your presentation, you will need a 5-minute extension. Mr. Speaker, do I understand you to say that her half an hour is finished? Yes. But that, that does not include the seven minutes that, that was paused with the points of order, sir. Honorable member, the time that was allocated has elapsed. It's not that a question, sir. In, in that is including the time that was given back for the interruption. No, sir. I'm sorry. I have never done this before. I have never challenged this before, sir. I clocked, I clocked all my people. She started at 5.26. She has half an hour that would take her to 6 o'clock uh, and then a five minute extension after that. But she had seven minutes interruption. Therefore, sir, she has not finished unless now, of course, there's another interruption. But I, I hate to disagree with you, sir. I don't mean any disrespect, but something's wrong with the timing that I haven't seen happen here before. Honorable member, in order to conclude your presentation, you will need a five minute extension. Mr. Speaker, I will ask for an extension. However, I would also politely like to ask, could you say what time she was clock starting? 
because it would be up there in the record. It should be up there in the record. I therefore ask that my colleague be given time to conclude, but I also ask that I be informed of what was the time she commenced her presentation. She Honorable member, you commence your presentation at 24, 24, according to the speaker's clock that is in front here. You will need a five minute extension to conclude your presentation. Mr. Speaker, looking across to our record for women from 2020 to 2022, of the approximately 20,500 lots allocated, 8,516 lots representing 4 to 3 percent of our total house lots were allocated to women only. Mr. Speaker, we were accused by members of the opposition of not doing enough for women. But surprisingly, Mr. Speaker, they would neglect to quote the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report of 2022, which showed Guyana improved its position by 18 points, moving up in its global ranking on gender parity in just one year, from a ranking of 53rd to 35th. Mr. Speaker, this is by no accident. This is because of conscious work that we are doing conscious policy making to ensure that we bridge the gender gap and ensure that there is equality. Mr. Speaker, a total of 73.8% of our total allocations went to low and moderate income families. 73.8%, Mr. Speaker. So while the AP and UAFC uh, were giving lands to cronies in, in 200 acres of land in Linden, and they claim to love Linden so much, those 200 acres of land could have produced 1,000 house lots for Lindeners. But we are ensuring that our housing program protects our vulnerable people. And we have, issue, we have further assistance through our steel and cement subsidy to help low-income earners acquire a mortgage and to get on their way to home ownership even faster. Mr. Speaker, evidence of our successful housing program can be seen in the banking sector, where we've seen consistent growth in real estate mortgages loans. In 2021, it was 3.7% increase. In 2022, 5.5% increase. In 2023, 9.8% percent increase. These numbers tell the story, Mr. Speaker, of our housing program's impact on increased access to finance. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. These are the facts that our people need to hear. Mr. Speaker, turning my attention now to the water sector, we have embarked on a transformative path to support the rapid economic expansion and to deliver on communities as set out by our five-year strategic plan in the portable water sector. Mr. Speaker, you would recall that we took our water sector in shambles, that the company was bankrupt, and we had to take that sector and ensure that we rejuvenate the water sector. We have removed VAT on portable water. We've restored a monthly water subsidy to over 28,000 pensioners to the tune of $523 million. We have reduced water tariff by 5% in 2021 to ease the hardship that citizens face. This provides an estimated $260 million annually in disposable income to our people. And more importantly, we have issued a policy decision that water tariffs will not increase as a result of increases in fuel prices. The government of Guyana has been absorbing this increase so that it is not passed on to consumers. The government has expended in excess of $15.4 billion to support the expansion of water distribution systems, drilling of 33 new wells, and providing improved level and quality of service, including first-time access to potable water to more than 35,000 people in over 60 communities nationwide. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a strategic five-year plan for the Guyana Water Inc., which will see coastal water coverage treatment on the coast improved from 52% where it was in 2020 to 92% by 2025. And to realize this, we have already executed seven 
contracts for the construction of seven water treatment plants, which will see us um, getting closer to achieving our 90% treated water program. And similarly in the hinterland, more than $2 billion has been invested in our hinterland, hinterland regions from 2020 to now, and a further $1.4 billion will be invested in 2023, all to provide 100% access to water services to all riverine and hinterland communities targeted to be achieved by 2025. And I dare say, Mr. Speaker, that we have seen tremendous success in our hinterland housing program, which has seen access improve from 4 to 6% in 2020 to 75% by the end of 2022. And by the end of 2023, after we have executed this budget, implemented the programs, in this year's budget, we will be at 85% access across our hinterland communities. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, the opposition has spoken about there's no excitement in the budget. But Mr. Speaker, people don't need excitement. People want development. People want a government that is consistent, a government that is measured and responsible, a government that is not reckless, a government that can display true leadership and commitment to transforming the lives of every single Guyanese. Mr. Speaker, we have a far superior program to anything offered by the APNU AFC government. Mr. Speaker, I just, in wrapping up, I just would like to thank the members of the of staff of the Ministry of Housing and Water who have been working overtime from 2020 to now. Mr. Speaker, they, have, they, they work nights, they work weekends, they work 24 hours to ensure that we can deliver on this housing and water program. Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank the Honorable Dr. Ashley Singh for recognizing the importance of this sector and his staff. And I commend this budget, Mr. Speaker, for passage in this Honorable House.